It feels very much, doesn't it, like two goals should be enough. Just a quick reminder that the highlight show is coming your way right here at 10.30 this evening, so stick around for that. See what happened in the three other games this evening. But let's get some reaction. We're still waiting for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer to appear. But for now, let's hear from Dan James. Here are his post-match thoughts. So, Dan, tell me all about this match. 2-0, away win. It's a perfect match for Man United. Yeah, it's a massive win for us. We knew it was going to be hard coming here. Um, but to, to get that clean sheet today was very important. I think Marcus took his goal very well today. And thankfully Bruno slotted that pen at the end. So um, obviously we've got a, there's still a second leg. Um, I mean, we've still got to concentrate on that next week. But the important thing for us now is to recover and get ready for Sunday. It seemed like a very physical game. You guys lost three players for the second leg. It shouldn't be easy. But how, how physical was it? What was your sensation? Yeah, I think we always knew it was going to be a tough game physically. Um, I think we just had to match that today. I think we had to make sure we did um, and then play our football. And that's where obviously the first goals come from. And then we've obviously fighted to the end and got that penalty. You had a great international week, a goal against Czech Republic. Now an away win in the Europa, in the Europa League. So Man United is almost on the semi-finals. It's been a, a really, really good season for you. Are you happy? Yeah, of course. Um, I mean, it's... Just keep smiling, keep playing. Um, no, really happy. I think today is obviously a great win for us. We've got to go into obviously next week now with the the same um, the same attitude um, as today, really. Um, but as I said, Sunday's a massive game for us. Um, we've just got to get back, recover, and get ready for that one. Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much. Absolutely, we'll find out what happens on Sunday. Uh, we're keeping Goncalo Moreira busy because as soon as he'd finished speaking. To Dan James, Oli Gunnar Solskjaer appeared and this is what Oli made of tonight's Manchester United performance. Oli, two away goals, a clean sheet. This is a perfect night for United. <laughs> no, it's not a perfect night. Of course, we get, we get a couple of uh, or three yellow cards and three suspensions for next game. But a 2-0 result is uh, a very good result, of course. We know how difficult it is coming to Spain uh, to get these kind of results. We have to... Uh, uh, play well to get them and um, very happy with the result. And you also have uh, probably your top scorers scoring again and again and again because between Marcus Rashford and Bruno Fernandes they already have 15 European goals this season. Yeah, they have been exceptional. They have been so good for us and they're so important for us. The first goal, very good uh, run by Rashford and what a he, he takes the ball fantastically and fantastic uh, finish. And Bruno, I know, he's, he's so confident on penalties. Even though the goalkeeper almost saved it, it was uh, enough to uh, give us a good lead. With a two-goal advantage, what's going to be United's approach to the second leg? Uh, the same as we always do. We want to win every game of football because this is a, it's still a young team. It's a learning team. We have to improve all the time. We, we know in, in, uh, in football... Uh, it catches you so quickly if you rest and we cannot uh, have any other approach than go forward and try to create chances and score goals, especially at home. Old Trafford, is, uh, we, we, feel, we feel good at home, of course. Thank you very much, Oli. Thank you. Welcome back. Here are the results from this evening. Arsenal have scored in their last 12 away games in Europe and they'll need to do the same if they're going to make it through to the semi-finals because Slavia Prague got a late equaliser at the Emirates this evening. Ajax missed a penalty. They took the lead, but they lost 2-1 to Roma. And Villarreal with a first-half goal and the win in the end for them. But our focus is on this win for Manchester United up against Granada. We'll get some reaction from out in Spain in just a couple of moments. But first, let's get straight into this penalty incident. We've only seen it very briefly. It, it didn't look convincing at the time. Let's have another look now and give, give us your thoughts both. Well, I mean, I think as, if you're a defender there, you're just trying to get a feel for somebody who's, who's behind you. So you're trying to keep an eye on the ball and you've got an eye on Bruno Fernandes there. And he obviously catches Bruno Fernandes, but he's not really looking at him. He's just trying to get a feel for the ball where it's coming in and obviously catches Bruno. Um, and with him going down the way he does, I think it, it makes the referee's mind up. But as a player, because you've been there, haven't you, yeah. when you're trying to get a feel for someone and look at the ball as well? It's exactly what he, he's doing, yeah. As Fernandez is going in on goal, he's just trying to feel where he is, trying to know where he is. And Fernandez, look, he, he makes a meal out of it, doesn't he? I, I think he's lucky to get the penalty. Mm. And he's probably lucky to score it in the end as well. The keeper probably should do better. He's looking there, isn't he? It looks like he's saying to his teammates, oh, we got away with one there. It's, an, it's a difficult situation, that, for VAR, though, because we can all look at it and, in hindsight, say, oh, it should have overturned that. It, you know, it wasn't a punch, it was, it was just an incident. 
But then it has to be clear and obvious. VI has to have a really good reason for overruling the referee on the field of play. So you, you can kind of make a case for them not changing the referee's no, well, you, mind. You knew once you'd give it, that once you look at VAR, they're going to give it because it's not clear and obvious. And he has put his arm out and actually touched him. So there's no way there was, there's no way they're going to, he was going to overturn it. And look, it's, to me, it's not a penalty. Fernandez does very well to get the penalty. They'll be very disappointed because, as Owen said, he's just feeling where his player is. The ball's not even near him, and I don't think the ball would get near him anyway. It was always Cabani who's, who's going to get the header, and Fernandez is very clever about it, and he's fooled the ref basically. And, and, and he's fell for it. It changes things, obviously, from a United perspective. It calms the nerves a bit for the second leg. It, it really, though, takes the wind out of the Granada sails, doesn't it? Yeah, you're right, completely. I mean, at 1-0, it probably would have given him, you know, as Colsey said, not much of a chance because they didn't really attack. They're probably one of the few Spanish sides that don't really <laughs> get it down and play. But the thing is, at 1-0, you've got a chance. At 2-0, just don't see how they can score. Score a couple goals. So, I think for United, clean sheet couple goals, uh, you know, that kind of sealed it for them. Yeah, it feels like it, doesn't it? Psychologically yeah. for Granada at 2-0, it feels like Yeah, look, it's game it. over. At 1-0, as I said, I think it was game over. They do have a couple of suspensions, you know, I think three um, suspensions, which, which might have made it a little bit more difficult, but at 2-0, look, it's game over, Jake. Yeah, it's a good point, actually. We've got the suspensions, which we know about. Marshall has been ruled out, we think, towards the end of the season. He'll be lucky to play again this season. Then Eric Bai, he's on the list as well. That's COVID-related, so he may well get a negative result and be able to play. But that, is, again, is a reminder how important that second goal is because at 1-0, with, with those players not available, you, you'd have concerns, wouldn't you? Yeah, well, Harry Maguire plays literally every game. He's so yeah. important. Luke Shaw after Bruno Fernandes. He's been United's best player as well. Then McTominay is really important in midfield, so would have been three really important misses really for Ole Gunnar. So I think that 2-0 um, is makes it that much more important. Yeah, and we know that Luke Shaw as well went off at half-time tonight. We hope that's not a bad one in terms of an injury, either for him or for England. Yeah, we hope so. He, he does tend to pick up injuries now and yeah. again. I'll probably looking towards Sunday, Ole. It's a big game for him against Tottenham, of course. He's going for that top four. And with Marcus as well coming off, I think they're just he's just looking towards Sunday with a bit of luck. OK, well, look, if the penalty award... Or the penalty wasn't convincing. 1-0 certainly was. Can we have a look at it on the touch screen? Yeah, go on. We'll go have on. a look at it on the yeah. touch. I mean, this, was, this is what Scholes, you were, you, were, you were pretty much the best at, I think, <laughs> around. Why do, you, why, do you think, why do you think Granada drop off so much? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> uh, <laughs> normally, That's the analysis we're paying for <laughs> tonight, exactly. by the way. No, but honestly. Normally, I, I, pe teams, yeah. you either press yeah. or, or you Especially drop off. Especially when you're at home. Yeah. Yeah. And it surprised me. I think, I think this is Soldado, isn't it? And I think he, he's thinking about coming on to McTominay. And he's not really bothered about Lindelof having the ball, which is... But, of course, uh, look, it's interesting because... You see Durata there. He's yes. telling the boys to come back. Some of them want to press. Yeah. Some are coming back. Yeah. And to be fair, Durata, he's, he's really the one he's that helps it. make this call happen there. So he's telling the boys yeah. all to come back, which yeah. allows Lindelof... Yeah. Um, yeah, to come and play that there, yeah. ball. But keep an eye on... That's to, uh, to there, the right side of centre-back, really. And he's, he's responsible for... We can't actually see Marcus Rashford because he, he's had a shot there. But he's pointing at Marcus Rashford. But if we just run this on... It's funny, Owen. He's the one pointing at everyone and he's the one who doesn't do It's his job. job, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. He's telling everyone to come back. He's not looking over his shoulder. He's telling someone to pick Rashford up, someone to pick Fernandes up. And in the end, he's the one who gets done. He does, he's yeah. He's not deep enough. And do you know what? It's a great run for Marcus. I think you have to give uh, Lindelof and Marcus credit. When you run inside that fullback, it's so difficult for him to stay with that. And the pace Mark Marcus has got, he's got, Lindelof has then got a massive area to it. Who do you um, think controls this? Do you think Marcus is in control of this situation, yes. leading him? Or do you think Lindelof is in control? I, I, I think Marcus is in control. Look, they get it badly wrong by giving him time on the ball in the first place. But I think Marx's run then makes Lindelof's mind that up. That ball and is fabulous, isn't it, Scholes? Yeah, and it's not something we often see from Lindelof, to be fair. But it's a great ball, great, great run, great ball, great touch in, in mid-air as well. He brings it down lovely and a couple of little scrappy touches after that. But again, a, a lovely finish. Yeah, I mean, that's... Have you got I mean, more? we you tried got more to give you a bit of... Some more. We, no, we tried to give you a bit of something in terms of, you know, the, the ball of it. But obviously, I think Granada were in between two minds there. We said before the game, they're not a possession-based side. They're not a team that likes to press. So initially, they're quite high up the pitch. But then they all just 
tend to drop off. And I think for Marcus, Credit Marcus and, and Lindelof, really, they recognise that the space is there and they take it. It's nice to see teams actually play. We, we saw Real Madrid do that midweek, didn't yeah. we, against Liverpool. And it's nice to see teams not always, doesn't have to be between the lines. You can actually play that ball and it was class from both players. It's a good point. We get obsessed with playing out from the back and we kind of, we frown, don't we, on a long ball. But sometimes like that, it's just the most effective Yeah, thing. Do, you, do you know what? You're not wrong. The, the amount of times we see centre halves getting the ball on a six yard box and you think, are they ever going to play football and break all the way through? You hardly ever see it. And you see there, it's been one long ball, great run from Marcus. Marcus makes Lindelof's mind up and he starts to deliver the pass and he delivers it very well and, uh, and we know what happened. Great ball, but the real magic was from Marcus Rashford. What about that stat? It's the first United player since Wayne Rooney more than 10 years ago to manage 20 plus goals in successive seasons. That's some, that's some number. Oh, Marcus has been absolutely fantastic. He's been magic for Manchester United. And the thing is, they probably need, you know, another one of his type that can get you goals. I think Marcus running into space. I think Robbie Savage said it in commentary. Coming off that left-hand side, he looks like he prefers that the most. You know, a lot of talk of whether they're centre-forwards or not. We know he's good on set pieces, but he just gives United so much. You know, his, his touch is good. He runs in behind. He comes short. And uh, just feels like maybe they need a, someone else yeah. with him. He can play off the left whether that's going to be Hall under somebody else. But I just think Marcus is a, is a blessing for this. Well, well that's why they haven't competed for big trophies, really, since, since Wayne Moon is gone, since brilliant centre-forwards are gone. You know, Man United is always about players at the top end of the pitch being able to score goals. You almost want, when they play with the back three now, you're looking at 60 to 70 goals. Yeah. I'm not sure what the Liverpool lads did, the, the three Liverpool players, um, but it must be 60, 70 goals between them. United have not had that for a long time. They always have one who seems to get close to 20. We know Marx has done it a couple of, for a couple of years. And I think they've got the potential to have that. With, with Mason, still a young player, next couple of years, I think he should be capable of that. Anthony Martial, I always think he should be capable of that. But I do think they're desperate for that number nine. Who should it be? <laughs> Look, who should it be? Haaland's the obvious one. And Harry Kane, these types of players... Will they come to Man United at this point? Can United pay the money for them? I think they probably can, but I think it's up to them which club they choose. I think the two of them would probably have the choice of any club in Europe. It's interesting, this Haaland situation, isn't it? Because we know that in 2022, there's the clause that means it's less than €70 million Euros to buy him. So do you go now, player, know that you've got him? I mean, you said on Tuesday night on the Champions League, it's an investment, so you just pay the money and you go and get him. But everyone seems to be keen to tell everyone that they're not going to do that. I, I don't know. Do you see United spending that kind of money, 150 million on a on a player? Uh, I, I think they probably would. Yeah. You think they do it this summer? If, if it meant getting Haaland, then yeah, why not? The interesting thing is, you know, he's he's taken real considered steps, hasn't he? From from you know where he's been, he, he wanted to go to Mulder because they had one of the best academies, yeah. In, yeah. and then he wants to go to Salzburg, and then he wanted to go, you know, then he wants to go to Dortmund. So he's considered every step. He's had options all along the way. And it just feels like this is definitely not going to be about money. You know, it's going to be about getting the right fit. And what is the right fit for him? Is it a team that plays like Man City? Is it United? Everybody, everybody could need him. Chelsea could need him. Barca, you know, would he go there to help maybe keep Messi to stick around? So I can't think of a player this young that is, um, I think has been about, as coveted by yeah, everyone. I, yeah. I think it's about the club who, who could pay for him now. I don't think there's too many of them. You think of Real Madrid and Barcelona, all the noises you hear, they probably couldn't pay that type of money. Man City don't look like they want to pay that type And you know, to be fair, Guardiola, they very rarely play with a number nine anyway. Even when he's had Aguero and Jesus fit, he's, he's hardly played them. So is that the type of player that uh, Guardiola wants? I, I, I'm not sure it is. I, I, look, it's a player United were desperate for, a player Chelsea would be desperate for. And they're probably the two clubs who I think could probably afford to pay that this summer. 